think we're going to start. We're going to start with our first session, our keynote speaker. We are, we are having Grady Booch. That, who knows Grady Booch? You should, by the way. Yes, thank you. I will well, save you some time on that huge introduction because he has more achievements than I have ever seen in one description. He's a fellow of everything, written six books. Uh, he co-founded a language. Come on. I mean, it's pretty common in build stuff, I think, but for me, it's like a language. And like, <laughs> it's a thing. So we already have him on the screen. Hi, Brody. Uh, Hello. Okay. Hello. We can hear you. We can see you. And uh, don't forget that you can uh, ask as many questions as you want after uh, he's finished. And uh, well, if we will have something interesting online, we will also ask those questions. So um, I think we can go. Are you ready? I was born, I was for, this born for this moment. Okay, Grady. So, <laughs> Grady Booch, speaking of the future of software engineering. Well, let's hear that. Let's go. Actually, well, uh, <laughs> reaching you from Maui, Hawaii, of all things. Um, it's actually late at night. It's about 10.30, a little bit warm. I wish I was there with you, but thanks to COVID, I guess. Uh, I'm not traveling and haven't traveled for two years now, but one of these days I would dearly love to visit your country. What's a day in the life of Grady? Uh, I, there is no common day. I spend perhaps 50% of my time working with customers on their architecture. There's a very, very large federal project I'm engaged with. It has real-time elements. It has classic web scaling elements. Kubernetes is the center of it. I'm working with a, a large auto manufacturer. I'm working with another transportation company. Uh, you name it, and it sort of keeps me busy, and it's a lot of fun. I spend maybe 30% of my time on AI kinds of things. That's why you see all the robots behind me. Uh, this little, little guy back here, uh, Pepper is its name from Alderbear and Slosh SoftBank. We've been using that in some work with NASA on uh, the Robonaut 2, uh, which is a humanoid robot they have up in the space station. And I'll move this a little bit. You see this cluster here. This is actually a uh, four NVIDIA Jetson Nanos running Kubernetes. So I've got my own little cloud here, and I'm doing that for some work uh, taking place with regards to some uh, neural symbolic architectures uh, that we've been dealing with. And we'll touch upon that again toward the end of this presentation. I am, I am infinitely accessible. Here's my email address. Uh, follow me on Twitter every time I gain a Twitter follower and Angel gets its wings. And uh, go check out the website. But uh, I always respond to, to questions uh, that people might ask. All software, all software developers, we're all noble characters as software engineers. But, you know, we come from an interesting and long history. The first engineer that I've run across is Imhotep. He came around the time of Egypt in the 27th century. And it was kind of cool because this guy was not only an architect, he was the high priest of the sun god Ra. So if anybody asks what you do, you can say, I'm descended from a priest of the sun god. And that sounds pretty cool. May get you some dates, I don't know. But on the other hand, a few centuries later, and in uh, 19th century BCE, uh, the Code of Hammurabi said, hey, by the way, if you're a builder and you build something and somebody gets injured or dies, we're gonna kill you as well too. Happily, this hasn't translated well to software, but the point of these two slides represents that it is both a privilege as well as a responsibility to be a developer, and certainly so in the world we do. Another notable engineer is Ashmiel Adrazari. Actually, it may be a set of brothers, but they wrote this marvelous book in the 12th century in Turkey um, in the golden age of Islam titled The Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices. This, frankly, was the first pattern language. It represented common ways to solve common problems, and it, in many ways, began to show the way that we engineers could codify what we're doing. Well. More recently, where does the term engineer come from? And it actually brings us to Wyoming. You may never have thought of uh, this isolated state being the renaissance for it, but it was. So here we are at the turn of the century, the last century, in which we were expanding, at least in the US, expanding across the West. We were building roads, building dams, building railways. And the problem is many of these were failing. Um, 
locomotives would blow up because we didn't really design the boilers right, dams would fail. This was not a good thing. And so there was a desire to achieve some degree of accountability, and the state of Wyoming was the first to do so. They said, look, if you're going to do these big projects, you're going to be licensed as engineer. And the very first engineer was Charles Bellamy in Wyoming in 1907. Well, if we think about the software side of things, many people say, hey, you know, it really came out during World War II, and it really kind of did. The idea of systems engineering came into the forefront because of Bell Labs, because this is the time frame in the 40s and 50s, we were beginning to see machines that were not just analog, but were digital. And the problem was not just mechanical or chemical, but it was the whole system engineering. And so the idea of systems engineering came to play. As for software engineers, there's a little bit of a funny thing going on here because most engineers view engineering as what's called an occupational closure, meaning to call yourself an engineer, you have to graduate from an accredited college, you've got to pass an exam, you've got to work as an apprentice, and you keep doing studies along the way. This was attempted in software. Uh, there was work in Canada, for example, led by my dear friend, Philippe Krushton, where they began to license software engineers. They tried it in the state of Texas, but it never came to pass because I think we as an industry, we're still very, very young and we ourselves have not begun to codify fully what it is we do. In fact, we are so young, the terms we use are within the lifetime of probably your parents or your grandparents. Annie Cannon, she'll come back in the story a little bit later. She was one of the first computers because back then the term computer meant he or she that computes, calculates things, and most of them are women. The idea of digital was not coined until 1942 by George Stibitz, and the term software was not coined until 1952. We are an extraordinarily young domain. So the term software engineering, most people think, came about because of the NATO conference in 68. This is the heydays of the software crisis, and Bauer proposed the term because he thought it was kind of controversial. Turns out it wasn't the first. In fact, in August of 66, the president of the communications of the ACM wrote a letter in this TACM that distinguished between hardware engineering and software engineering. So he was a little bit earlier, but he wasn't even the first. I found in my research in 1965, there was a, uh, a classified ad in a journal uh, spread around through Silicon Valley, was it called Silicon Valley then, asking for a software engineer, the first instance I found of a job title for software engineer. Turns out that wasn't the first. And really, it's this woman, Margaret Hamilton, who we can claim as being the person who invented the phrase software engineering. She worked with SAGE, a term we will talk about in a moment, the semi-automatic ground environment, and that she developed software for the Skylab and the Apollo as well too. She coined the term when she was working at Draper Lab because everyone else around her were mostly mechanical or electrical engineers, but she was doing something very, very different. And she wanted to distinguish what she was doing and therefore she called herself a software engineer. Is what we do in art or a science? Well, it depends. Grace Hopper, uh, she thinks it's an art. Uh, Dykstra believes it's very much an art. Knuth believes it as well too. I frankly prefer the ideas of Dave Parnas where he says it's really both that what we do as engineers requires us to be intensely creative, but there is also some really formal engineering below it. Indeed, the reason I speak of this as an engineering problem is because it is the resolution of forces. As a developer, as an engineer, we are faced with trying to build a, a reasonably optimal system that does all the things various stakeholders want us to do. And there are competing needs. In fact, there are often conflicting needs. The usual mich mission cost schedule, uh, the context in which you're doing it uh, was certainly going to play a role. Legacy will play a role. All the illities, reliability, performance, functionality, and the like. And increasingly, the systems we build have legal and ethical implications. So we as engineers, we as developers live in the center, and we have to build systems that push back against those forces. And those aren't just static forces, they are dynamic forces. And we don't even know at the beginning what they might be. If you want a real summary to talk to your non-software friends about what you do, 
here's a great thing you can sketch out in a, on a napkin. In fact, my dear friend, Brand Selleck, upper right corner, he wrote this literally on a, on a napkin and to explain his ideas. X-axis is time, Y-axis is intensity. Every software project looks like this. So when I get parachuted into a project, they say, oh, Mr. Wizard, help us. The first thing I'll ask is, what's your heartbeat of releases? Do you have a regular rhythm of releases? And that's the, the, the thing you see at the bottom. If they don't, then we first work on that and try to put into place a CICD pipeline. Once you've got that, then you will see this series of rhythms that take place. There's a period of discovery, that's the red. There's a period of uh, invention, that's the purple. And there's a period of implementation. And every successful project does these and they overlap with one another. There are periods, as we see in the very bottom, of what are called punctuated equilibrium. There are periods that are reasonably stable from which we can release people actually use and build and grow from them and learn from them. Looking at it another way, here's where architecture fits into play. What is architecture? All architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Architecture represents the most significant design decisions that represent the form and function of a system where significant is measured by cost of change. So again, the x-axis is time, y-axis is, just think of it as number of things. And over the lifetime of a system, you're gonna see billions upon billions of decisions being made. That's sort of the green. You see lots of them at the beginning, you'll see clusters of them, bursts of them throughout as you refactor the system, and they'll hopefully tail off toward the end as you start releasing the final system itself. The architectural decisions are smaller sets of those. They are the most significant ones, and that's what's represented in red. And notice that they peak at the beginning, but there are periods where they evolve over time. That's when we see major refactoring. As a good example, look at Photoshop. Photoshop started out as a, a project for industrial light and magic on special effects for Star Wars. Uh, the developers, two brothers, basically they, they were doing some things in the fight scenes and their manager went to Lucas and said, hey, George, these guys have built something really cool. What should we do with it? And Lucas didn't really care. He said, oh, just let them have the software. And now, of course, these are two very rich brothers. Uh, they evolved it over time and, and by my count, there are four or five major architectural transformations that have taken place in Photoshop. If you want to see the original one, the source code for the original Photoshop is available online at the Computer History Museum. So here's your typical software development staff project within uh, Silicon Valley in pre-COVID days. So look closely, see if you notice anything interesting here. Well, there are different machines. Some have multiple monitors, some don't. Some are Macs, some are PCs, some are Linux boxes, uh, the usual GORP around the room. My first reaction when I saw this was, my God, where did they hide the women? Well, we'll come back to that, but it's all too true that women have often been pushed out of um, software development efforts, but believe me, they have been essential in the history of software engineering. Indeed, let's go to the time of Babbage. So here was Babbage doing his thing. He had the great ideas of the difference engine, the analytic engine, but very importantly, he had Ada Lovelace by his side. And Ada, we can consider to be the first programmer because she really understood that what he was doing there was something separate from the machinery. And furthermore, those symbols could represent things other than numbers. So she is the first one that really represented that great leap of abstraction. Indeed, all of software engineering, the whole history of our world, of our community, is one of rising levels of abstraction. Around the very same time, George Boole was doing his thing. And boy, you talk about Hutzpah. He wrote a book called An Investigation of the Laws of Thought. That's where Boolean algebra comes from, but think about it for a moment. He was attempting to describe how minds work and try to codify formal ways in which we thought. Now, he didn't obviously make it, but he laid the foundations for what we could do. And now we're in the realm of Annie Cannon. She's the woman in the front with a magnifying glass. This looks like your typical scrum stand-up meeting, doesn't it? You got the manager in the back saying, what are you going to do today? And what, you know, what, what, are your, what's your, what are your blocks? And everybody else is sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, and trying to get their real work done. And they self-organize. What you're looking at is the Harvard computers in the round of late 1800s. And these were the people who took the astronomer data 
astronomer in the back is Pickering, who led the Harvard Astronomy Department. And the women here were the ones who took that data and analyzed it. They are really the first Agile team because a lot of their work, not all of their work, was really about self-organizing. Indeed, some of the things that Annie Cannon has done still live with us today. The way we measure luminosity is based upon her. So we can think of her as the first human computer. Now, as we began to mechanize things, an important element came into play, and that's the economics of development. All of a sudden, we had more machines. Notice those devices in front of the women. And these were simple calculators and subtractors. And so what we have here is a pipeline architecture. Notice the in-baskets by these women. But what happened is somebody would put in a calculation. A woman would do some simple calculation. She'd pass it over to the next, and it would go down the pipeline. Now terribly repetitive. If an error happened in one place, it would cascade through. But by and large, that's how computing took place. In fact, Richard Feynman, if you know of him from the physics uh, world, he led a lot of the computers in the Manhattan Project, and they looked exactly like this kind of situation. Another interesting thing that was happening in the space outside the software and hardware world was the work of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Now, you may have seen the movie with Steve Martin, Cheaper by the Dozen. It's a funny movie about uh, this couple with 12 kids. It was the kids of the Gilbreths. They had 12 kids. But their real work was time and motion studies. And they came up with this way to describe how people did work in terms of what they called process charts. Today, we call them flow charts. So the idea came way back. As our machines became more powerful, then the imbalance of, of cost of the machine versus the human changed. And our machines now were becoming much more expensive than the humans. And so we saw this shift. So all of a sudden, fewer machines and the women were pushed out of the middle of this. So we saw the beginnings of, of some gender changes taking place in the world itself. Uh, Gertrude Blanche was a particular particularly interesting person at this time, along with Eckert, because they, they're perhaps the first methodologists. They devised ways to say, hey, if you're gonna do this particular kind of problem with a punch guard, this accounting element, here's how you would organize your machines. First pattern language, first methodology. This then is the Harvard Mark II, which was out of uh, Harvard, built by IBM. The woman on the right is Grace Hopper again. And what we're seeing here is the increasing mechanization of our of our machines, but we still didn't really have software. It was still the hardware and the and the computational power of it were all wrapped up together. But when Stibitz came along and began to propose these ideas of how to take Boole's concepts and bring it into mechanization, and von Neumann at the same time as well, laying some of the foundations, Aiken was the guy really behind the Harvard project. Grace was there as well too, but she, like Ada Lovelace, had a slightly different idea saying, you know, wait a minute, there's a different process going on with regards to the computational side of it. And so let's see if we can devise some ways to do some machine independent programming. In a different world, if uh, the World War II had turned out differently, I would be speaking to you in German and we would be talking about the exploits of Konrad Zusa. But we didn't because of this. This is the Colossus, uh, a project that was done at, at Bletchley Labs. In fact, Bletchley Labs has an operational one there. Um, it was the machine used to break the Lorenz code, which made a major difference in the conduct of World War II. If you've seen the movie, The Imitation Game with Cumberbatch, great movie, wonderful acting, uh, beautiful cinematography, absolutely a lousy history. That's not the way the world turned out. This machine was designed by Tommy Flowers, and it was very much an electromechanical machine, actually vacuum tube machine, that was very clever, and it was to some degree programmable. Now, the real programming stuff, I'll, I'll move here, was really around the time of the ENIAC. And this is, again, late World War II, where much like in the days of, of Annie Cannon and the human computers, you'd see a set of mathematicians that would say, hey, here's an equation for this ballistic table, or here's an equation for this nuclear explosion, make, make it happen. And there were a set of women these five in particular, who were the primary programmers for the ENIAC, they were agile in the sense that they were a self-organized team. They're the ones who took those equations, then ran them to the plug boards. They understood the machines intimately and were able to build the machines or program the machines in the way that would do what they needed to do.
Well, as we started building machines that were truly programmable, then there was another shift here. The whole problem of programming became indeed a problem. It's weird to think of it, but back in the day, in the late 40s, early 50s, the very idea of a subroutine was considered to be incredibly controversial. Why would you have a subroutine? Why would you have these kind of things? Because they were computationally expensive. These days, we don't think about it at all because it's an important way we deal with complexity. Back in the, back in the time, it was a significant design decision. And this is also the time that Eckert and Mockley, along with Grace Hopper, were beginning to codify the notions and the practices of programming with their sets of machines. Von Neumann was doing a similar kind of thing with the Joniac, and it was interesting how far ahead he was looking, because around this time, he was trying to write programs for meteorology, uh, for nuclear simulations, and for artificial life, way, way ahead of his time. Well, then John Backus came onto the scene, because now we were dealing with lots and lots of of mathematical things that we could run, but they were very difficult to express to our machines. So he was put on task to build a language called Fortran, formula translation. And around the same time, Goldstein and von Neumann were developing the ideas inherited from the, the Galbraiths into what became flowcharts. So we had this wonderful mixture of tools for the developer. Our algorithmic languages in Fortran and our methodological ways in flowcharts to bring these together. In the 50s and 60s, early 60s, we were in a funny place because we had this mixture of still punch card things on the right, but also more electronic things like you see on the left. That's a Ramek disk. I think if I'm not mistaken, this was about 50 megabytes of storage, like, you know, a GIF, if you would. And it was weighed about a ton and cost several million dollars. Obviously, we've come a long way. And in fact, as people were writing more and more software, primarily in Fortran, they found that lots of common things were happening. In fact, Pinkerton, in his work on a computer called Leo, was recognizing the same kind of routines over and over again. And so he said, you know, let's separate these. And rather than writing them each time, let's turn this into what he called an operating system. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the creation of a, a society called Share, which was a set of IBM customers. IBM didn't sell its software, they just kind of gave it away because they were making uh, money off of the machines itself. But software was a real problem for its customers. And so they got together and said, hey, let's share our code. So literally it was sort of the first open source efforts back in the 50s in which people would, here's a deck of cards that does this binary search, hey, you can have it kind of thing. Now that covered the, the mathematical world, but the business world was coming into the forefront as well because they were seeing this explosion of data. And so Grace Hopper, Bemer, and Stamet and a few others got together and said, hey, let's create this thing called COBOL, which will be, of course, the language to end all languages. We won't need any programmers because our business people can just you know write what they want down. Of course, that didn't turn out. Well, as we are here in the 50s and 60s, this was the height of the Cold War. There's a phrase I use that says that all of modern computing is woven on the loom of sorrow. It really comes out from a lot of the things that happened in World War II and the Cold War, and the SAGE is a good example of it. So back in the day, this is when Russia was the dominant threat in the world, the major competing powers of, of Russia and the United States. It fueled the space race, and it was a very serious concern. I mean, back in my day, it was you know global thermonuclear war was, was a real threat. So the Department of Defense in the U.S. built this system called the SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. We had a series of radar sites uh, north of the United States into Canada, across through Alaska, that would look uh, for any aircraft that might come over. And the data was all relayed to this particular kind of, kind of uh, command and control center spread across the country. There were perhaps 30% of all programmers in the United States were involved in this. It was the largest software project at its time. And it was this time frame in which we could speak of as the software crisis because it was just darn hard. It was also the time we began to explore real-time programming. That's the monitors you see in the back. So it wasn't just batch programming anymore. It was real-time, hard real-time kind of stuff. Indeed, Forrester and Evans and Strakey, they were the ones who were beginning to pioneer the ideas in that space. 
as you move toward the, the middle of the 60s, this was sort of the first golden age of software engineering. It was the era of the programming priesthood. So now you've got your machines. The IBM 360 was the dominant machine at the time in all its variations. And it was vastly more expensive than an individual programmer. So there was a lot of work done to optimize for the needs of the machine at the expense of the programmer. So this is where modern waterfall methods came into play. If machine time is expensive, then we want to get our code right first. So there's a period of requirements, a period of design, you write your flowcharts, you sort of code it out on coding sheets, pass it over to be punched, and you carry it to the machine and they'd run it and get you your, your results back later in the day, potentially. So again, the economics drove this because the machines were so expensive, but the software problem was very real as well. And that's where methodologies such as structured analysis and design came into play. Indeed, it was Larry Constantine and Edgar Dykstra who were the ones who were really pioneering those ideas. Fred Brooks, it was from this experience that he wrote the Mythical Man Month that led us to the ideas that you probably all know about there. Hiding in the shadows there were there are some interesting folks. And this is a story that repeats itself through our history and that there is a mainstream with there's stuff happening on the side you need to pay attention to. O.J. Dahl and Kristen Nygaard were beginning to think about object-oriented stuff. Tony Hoare and Robert Floyd thinking about formalisms and functional programming in particular. And now we're at the time again of, of, uh, of Margaret Hamilton. So we're dead in the center of the software crisis. She's standing here by a printout from some of the Apollo software, which by the way, if you want to look at the Apollo software, the landing software for the LEM, it's also available at the Computer History Museum. Go take a peek. One of the outputs of the results of the, the Cold War is that it led to miniaturization, miniaturization of transistors and the microprocessor. And so all of a sudden in the 70s, we were sitting at a time where we had lots of mini computers. And now we were kind of at equity with regards to the cost of the machine and the cost of the programmer. And so development was becoming much more personal. This, by the way, is the era in which I sort of entered the scene. Uh, ask yourself for a moment, when did you get your first email address? Think of that. I got my first email address in 1979 when it was still the ARPANET. In fact, it was really cool because we had this little book that we had that listed the email address of everybody in the world. It was like a 20 page document. It was pretty impressive. Man, I wish I had kept it, but that's how small the internet was at that time frame. But this was the golden age of, of the first golden age of software development. You had the ideas of, of various stepwise refinement, Parnas's information hiding, uh, Barbara Liskov's abstract data types, ER relationship. On the left-hand side is a, a dear colleague as well, Wynn Royce. He's, he's no longer with us. I had the pleasure of working with Wynn, Wynn on a project uh, with Lockheed some years ago. But you may recall his very famous paper about the waterfall methods. Now, he gets a lot of a lot of dissing for it because he people say, oh, he invented waterfall. No, his paper really was explaining this is what you shouldn't do. And uh, he kind of got, you know, marked as being the waterfall guy, but he really wasn't. And you'll you'll run across the names such as Larry Constantine, Ed Jordan, Michael Jackson, Tom DeMarco, really the people that led structured analysis and design techniques. Because think of it, the problem here of complexity was how do I best organize my algorithms? Because the main way we decomposed was through algorithms through through our algorithm, algorithmic abstractions. We had languages such as Fortran, a C was on the scene, BASIC was coming up around the time, but complexity was manifest primarily in algorithms. Again, in the shadows, we had John Backus working on FP and the like, Leslie Lamport beginning to understand the problems of distribution. I had the delightful opportunity to spend a day with John actually about a month before he passed away. And uh, there's an oral history, you can, you can listen to the two of us. But I asked him about FP and he said, you know, I asked John, wh why did functional programming never really hit the big time? And he said, well, Grady, it's because it's really easy to do hard things with functional programming, but it's really hard to do easy things with functional programming. It has a role. It's found it's a niche in serverless systems for, again, economic reasons, because now we're building things in which you're, you're being charged by execution, not by instance, and sort of pushes people to write functions, which makes a lot of sense. 
The world changed again with the rise of the mini with, of the microcomputer. Now all of a sudden, programming was in the hands of a lot of non-programmers, and so literally hundreds of thousands of people began to write programs. In an exciting, innovative time for us, and then these three rogues came onto the scene. Uh, you may have heard of them. I don't know. They're not to be trusted. They're crazy guys, but they did what they did. But they were on the scene at a very curious time because we had the rise of systems that were distributed. We were building larger and larger systems, and we were sort of running out of steam with regards to what we could do in algorithmic languages. So around this time, it was the second golden age of software engineering. Um, I had developed the Booch method, Jim had developed o OMT, and we were fierce competitors in the marketplace. And so we at Rational decided, hey, one way to make the competition go away is we're going to just hire Jim. And so Jim and I were tasked to unify our methods. About a year later, we bought Evar's company. We were doing some work with Ericsson and thought it was the right thing functionally, so economically. So we brought him in, and the three of us came together. And in 1997, we, we formalized the UML and the process around it. But it wasn't just us. There were lots of people around that time. Stephen Meller, Rebecca Wurst-Brock, Pete Code, Ed Jordan, and the like. Again, thousands of people who were contributing to what was going on in this space. Very, very vibrant time. But today, where is OO, A, and D? Well, it's kind of in the atmosphere. It did what it needed to do, but it kind of colors everything we do in many ways. Also in the shadows, you saw a number of other things happening. The economics of software and the methodology associated with it began to be studied and practiced a little bit better. You talk about you know clean, clean code. Well, Harlan Mills really came up with the idea first in clean room software engineering. The idea of, of literate programming, it also came from, from much earlier with, uh, uh, with some of the folks around this time frame. In fact, it was Don Knuth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as we began to build systems that were distributed in nature, all of a sudden our programs began to look like this. They were linked, they were distributed, and it was still you know, kind of fuzzy, but it changed the very nature of the kind of systems we were building because current, concurrent and distributed systems are just fundamentally much more complex than ones that are monoliths that are sequential, just the nature of the beast itself. So it was within this realm that you saw the rise of Scrum, you saw the rise of XP, you saw the rise of ideas of refactoring, and indeed some of the early foundations of Agile programming was led in some of the things we did with the Rational Unified process. Where does that name sound so familiar? Walker Royce. Oh, that's the son of Win Royce. So Walker and Win were both methodologists, one more on large scale waterfall things and his son working on agile kinds of things. This is also the realm of design patterns. Now, this is where the Agile group, uh, Agile Alliance and the Hillside group came to play. Kent Beck and I were, were doing a lot of things in design patterns and we said, hey, let's sponsor a conference a little workshop so we got together with some of the usual design suspects and we met at a place uh, my place up in colorado in the mountains and we were standing on the hillside hillside one day reading christopher alexander's book and we had this revelation as a group as to the power of design patterns within software and thus we call ourselves the hillside group Mary was around the same time as well in which he was extending those ideas of design patterns to architectural patterns themselves and sort of all the pieces were, were falling into place here. Configuration management, open source ideas, the economics of outsourcing coming into play. And then the world changed again with the rise of mobile devices because all of a sudden the economics vastly changed. We had literally billions of devices for which we could write programs. And now all of a sudden, the nature of our software changed, and now we had the problem of distributed systems with great power on the computational edge itself. So. Around this time, you saw the Agile Alliance come to be. I, I would have been a signatory, but I didn't wasn't able to make it to uh, to uh, Snowbird. I had to was literally called away that week with a customer. I was one of the founding members of the Alliance, but wasn't there for the signing of the document itself. But its ideas certainly live on. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
what began to happen is we saw those basic kind of connections begin to coalesce as, as things do. And we saw the emergence of clouds, these sort of central places in which computation was taking place. And that led to increases in the ideas of DevOps. You could think of DevOps as the unification of the networking problem and the deployment problem together with the, the software problem itself. DevOps is really a problem of cross-cutting concerns within a software system that cut across the physical parts of a system. And so what began to happen is you saw the rise of these, these, uh, uh, these walled gardens, the first of which was perhaps uh, Salesforce and their ideas of software as a service, SaaS. That's what the purple things with the pixelated bits in it represent. It's sort of a, a domain that some platform owns. It's a platform and it's represented by a series of, of services that are offered up. Now, the idea of services back then was incredibly controversial. And one of the few people that really got the idea of that was Jeff Bezos. So early on in the days of, of Amazon, Jeff said to his developers, everything shall be a service. And people thought, oh, you're mad, you're mad, Jeff. Doesn't make any sense. This is even before SOAP, the simple object access protocol. But Jeff was very insistent. You can read his, his uh, memo about it, in which he basically says, it's my way or the highway, quite literally. And so they did it, but there was an important implication of this. And this is why architecture is important. Because of that decision, they were able to separate the pieces of the Amazon software platform such that now if somebody wanted to come in and set up a retail store that looked like Amazon, but it was their own store, they had a set of services whereby they could do it. So that was the first important major forward step in, in Amazon success. The next was with regards to AWS. They had all their infrastructure well proven for what they were doing. But again, it was defined by a set of services. So it was this very simple matter for them to say, hey, let's get some extra hardware over here, some extra cloud stuff, and we'll sell those services to our end customers. And that's what's born in AWS. Jeff Dean pretty much did the entirely similar thing, but in the platform of Google itself. So pause, deep breath. This is the world as it is today. We are in the realm where a lot of what we do is web-centric systems at scale and not to diminish the hard work that needs to be done, but we sort of understand how to build these things. This is why the world has moved toward Kubernetes. We understand the importance of components. We understand how to build tools for observability. Uh, we, we understand how to deal with systems of scale. It's given rise to frameworks such as Kafka and RabbitMQ and Redis and all that because they represent design patterns in a big way for large scale web-centric systems at scale. Now this doesn't mean everything is a web-centric system of scale. You've got hard real-time systems that run you know, pacemakers and running inside your car and the like, but even in those domains, we, we understand some of those design patterns. But what happens next? Well, think of it this way. On the left-hand side, you've got your imagination. On the right-hand side, what we as developers do is we build we build code. That's what, that's what we produce. We build things that sit out in the world and run and execute. That's, that's our end goal. What's the dis, what separates us from imagination to implementation? It's these things. Well, obviously, the laws of physics is the first one. You can't you know, pass information faster than the speed of light. Now, quantum computing, it's interesting. You're still not going to pass, uh, you're not going to compute faster than the speed of light, but it allows us to do some tricks that speed things up. But nonetheless, the laws of physics still intrude upon us. And then there are the algorithmic issues. And this is very much the realm of computer science in which you may say, theoretically, I know how to do this, but man, I don't know how to write this in code. That's where FFTs used to be, the fast Fourier transform. That's where the Viterbi algorithm used to be. The Viterbi algorithm is, is one of the essential algorithms that a gentleman by the name of Viterbi invented. That is the, the important algorithm that allows us to pull signals out of the noise of cellular channels. Without the Viterbi algorithm, we would not have cellular, cell phones, we wouldn't have wireless devices. So if I understand the theory and I have difficulty turning into that an algorithm, if I have problems with physics, that's a realm of computer science. You and I and the people sitting next to you, 
everything else on the right side is our problem. We as developers collect algorithms and choose the right abstractions. We form architectures out of them. We build our teams to be able to deliver these in repeatable and sustainable ways. We try to do it in a way that actually makes money and add value to the human experience. And indeed, in the very end, we try to build systems that do the right thing ethically and morally for us. Every line of code represents an ethical and moral decision, and that's the nature of the software we build today. <clears throat> so another way to look at it is this, um, and this is again across time. The early assistants were mathematical in nature. And so the problem there was just fundamentals of, my gosh, how do I even write an equation? The next generation was purely symbolic. And the problem there in the first generation of, of the golden age of software engineering was just one of managing algorithmic complexity. As we move toward personal computers and mini computers, then human computer interaction came into play. As we began to move to the web, the problem of scale came into play. And now, as Zuckerberg speaks of it, it's the metaverse. I hate that phrase, but it's kind of the realm in which we're in. It's not just his metaverse, but it's games, it's it's uh, it's computer games, it's the 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 world that our our kids live in and in their their online activities. It's the the worlds that we build within the software itself. And this is where the ethical and moral issues come to play. So if you're a developer building something disposable, it's like in the bottom right-hand corner, it's like a doghouse. You don't need no stinking diagrams. You don't need no stinking you know, plans. You just grab some wood, you build it. And if it fails, you just start it over again. If it really fails, you can always get yourself another dog. So, you know, the loss is not great, unless, of course, you really loved your dog, but that's another story. On the other hand, if it's your money and you're building your house, you bet you're going to do some designs. You bet you're going to have some blueprints because the risk increases. A lot of what we do today is neither of those two. It's what's on the left-hand side. It's like city management. Imagine if Elon came along and said, hey, French citizens, I am going to put a hyperloop that goes from La Défense to the Eiffel Tower. And the good citizens of Paris would say, oh, no, you are not, Elon, because that kind of change cuts across the culture, the economics, the very style of, of, of Paris itself. And so that's the nature of a lot of software that we build. We're not building one-off things that sit within isolation. But we tend to build things that exist within the world. This, by the way, is why startups are so fun, because you don't have to worry about legacy. But most of us deal with systems that live in the real world. All right, here's where we're seeing the next shift. We talked about the shift earlier of uh, symbolic computing, the microcomputer, the, the, the mobile devices. Here's the next change coming to play. Everything I've talked about thus far is, is symbolic in nature. It represents systems that have large scale of large amounts of data. We tend to build models and manipulate them. You're dealing with decision making, lots of calculation and the like. There's another way of looking at the world, and that's AI systems, systems that reason and that learn. This is my litmus test for them that to call it an AI, it must be both of these. Reasoning being inductive, abductive reasoning, one of those. But it's also a system that I no longer just program, but rather I teach and allow it to learn along the way. Let me do a quick history here. It's interesting that the ideas of artificial intelligence have a deep root in the human psyche. As, uh, as Stuart uh, Brand once said, we are as gods and we might as well get good at it. Well, in a way we've always, it seems in our human history, have tried to become gods. Uh, the very first representation of a golem was in Greek mythology for a golem that would walk around uh, the island of Crete and it would throw stones at any ships that got too near. Well. Even da Vinci had his ideas in this space. Uh, war is a terrible, nasty, bloody, sweaty kind of thing. And insofar as you can pull the humans out of it, the better you are. So da Vinci had this notion of mechanical knights that would do the fighting for you, obviously way ahead of its time. But that idea certainly took fruit in our psyche, in our, in our entertainment. This is from Metropolis. And so the idea of the humanoid robot was very much in, in the literature as it even is today. Of course, Turing around this time, well, around World War II was saying, hey, you know, we can think of a computer program as being intelligent if it's good at deceiving a human. It's interesting that 
we would find deceit as one of the hallmarks of intelligence, but nonetheless, that's the way it is. That's the Turing test. And so we see that brought to life in movies such as her, in which, in this case, you had an operating system, Samantha, that was truly a, a cognizant a conscious entity. In many ways, that's what some AI developers are trying to move toward, or if not that, at least not AGIs, at least some degree of intelligence. So whereas Boole devised the ideas of the theories of thought, the laws of thought in terms of Boolean logic, there's another way to approach it. And that way is through neural, neural implementations. In, in biological history, the first neurons appeared on Earth about 70 million years ago, or is it 700? 700 million, no, 70 million years ago. I may be off by an order of 10. It was a long, long before my time. And so evolution began to evolve the idea of computation via neural networks. We today have been able to map the entire neural network of the common worm. It's under 10,000 neurons. But it's not like the world is afloat with you know, killer worms that are, are dominating us. So it says we're missing something. We know how to map the entire neural network of the fly, which is around uh, several hundred thousand, uh, hundred thousand neurons. But it's not like we have you know, lots, of, lots of flies that are dominating us as well. The human brain, well, we're close to doing that. Uh, we're talking about a device that's you know, about 1,500 grams got a comparison here with other kinds of kinds of animals and the like. Ours has 100 trillion synapses, 100 billion neurons and running at 20 watts. The biggest neural network, artificial one today, it runs on a gigawatt or two, at least to train it. So we're a long way off from being able to do this. A lot of contemporary AI is really about pattern matching of signals. I've got a set of uh, images. What's in it? What, let me classify it. I've got a set of, uh, uh, of things people have bought to you know, help me identify what they might buy next. This is really all about inductive reasoning. It's not quite yet about decision making or abductive reasoning, which is model building, or causal reasoning is what Judea Pearl speaks of. So. We're in an interesting stage in, in AI, but there's still a lot more yet to come. In fact, the earliest days, this is much, much like the, the history you saw with symbolic computation, sort of begins formally with people such as Norbert Wiener, who was working in the analog domain. He wrote the classic book, Cybernetics. In fact, it's from his work that we, we speak of as cyber. But it was these two guys, Newell and Simon, that brought to us the idea of symbolic computation to express formalisms that could do AI kinds of things. Around the same time, Minsky and others were beginning to explore artificial neurons. This is, in fact, the very first artificial neuron called the Stark. It took six, six vacuum tubes to build it, and obviously it wasn't going to scale. So hardware went in a different direction. With, uh, with some of the work Minsky did, he, he basically bashed neural networks, and it didn't become alive for, for another few decades. So a lot of work was taking place in LISP in particular, knowledge engineering and the like. You saw the rise of the LISP machine, the connection machine, and indeed even Watson. So Watson really was a hallmark in the AI world because it, it beat a human in what seemed to be a classically human activity. No neural networks here. It was pretty much all statistical kind of AI. We threw a lot of hardware at it to make it happen. Google has done a similar thing with their TPUs, uh, their tensor processing unit, which is more neural network based in its nature. And in fact, we've been able to get it to the point where we can, we can take artificial neurons and shrink them down enough and put them in silicon so that we can today pack enough neurons uh, within about the same space as the human skull as, uh, as we, both in silicon and the humans themselves. But yet again, we don't know the software architecture to do that. But there are signs of hope. It's delicious being a software engineer to realize that the AI community is rediscovering all the things you and I know and love in classic software engineering. They're beginning to discover patterns, design patterns. So there are a set of design patterns in neural networks. The most important one these days is an architectural pattern called the transformer. Transformer uh, architecture is the basis of GPT-3. It's the basis of, of AlphaGo. It's sort of the, the go-to architectural style. Not the only one out there, but it's the dominant one.
The other interesting thing that's happening is that the life cycle of development for AI systems is beginning to adopt some of the things we have known in agile methods for a long time. Andruff is the, the head of AI for Tesla. And he observes, you know, if you're building an AI, it's kind of just like traditional software. It's a code base, there's configuration management, you're gonna do CI, CD, kind of all the same. And so if you're introducing AI to your projects, the nice thing is if you've got a mature agile process, it's going to be a lot easier to introduce AI within it. Um, let's think of it this way. That, and this is, by the way, where I'm spending a reasonable amount of my time in trying to build neural symbolic architectures, systems that have neural components, but also play together well with symbolic ones. Because they're computationally equivalent. They're, neuro, they're Turing complete, Turing equivalent, but they have different advantages and efficiencies. It's much easier for me to train a system to identify uh, a picture, an image, than it is to try to program it. But on the other hand, its explainability is not quite there. So this becomes an interesting design problem. And indeed, that's the problem. But in all of this, cool thing is the fundamentals still all apply. Uh, the problem these days is not so much building an AI, that's an interesting problem unto itself, but rather building real systems that have AI components within them. And what are the fundamentals that across these years have held true and will continue to hold true? You build crisp abstractions. You have a clear separation of concerns. You have a balanced distribution of responsibilities and simplicity. And process, much like you saw in the thing with Brand Selleck, was you want to grow a system through the incremental, iterative, and continuous release of executable architectures. Everything else is details. Now, the pendulum swings, we're seeing, you know, sometimes a little more emphasis, sometimes, sometimes less emphasis on, on architecture. Uh, the pendulum is swinging between cloud and edge as we get devices such as the NVIDIA Jetson Nano. It's changing where some of the computation takes place. Uh, scale in the presence of untrusted components is, is playing a role as well, too. And there's a lot of fun things to deal with. And so it's an exciting time to be a software developer. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's a privilege and a responsibility, but let me leave you with this and think of it this way. You and I are in a very noble place because we build things that change the world. It's a privilege to be a software developer because we are changing the world and it's a responsibility to be a software developer because we are changing the world. Think of it this way. Software is the invisible writing that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. Software is the invisible writing that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. And you are the storytellers. So go forth, write some great stories, please. Again, here's how you can reach me. I'm infinitely available. Feel free to drop me a line. And I think we may have a little time for some questions and answers. That was something, a full-on history lesson. Yes, we do have indeed some questions online and maybe in the public. Let me open them for you. Anybody has a question for the superstar? Don't leave me hanging. It's the first session today. Give me hope. If, if they don't ask me questions, I'm going to ask okay. you guys questions. I have questions for you online. Oh, okay. We have quite a few people right here, and I want them to wake up finally. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I'll, I will give you time in the audience, okay? Uh, we have a question from Danny. Uh, so, each crisis leads into a big evolution in engineering, software, and so on, like World War II, the Cold War, and so on. What do you predict for IT, software engineering, during or after COVID-19? Great question. Um, you know, being with a large company that was all entirely remote, I've been a remote employee since 1982, quite frankly. So COVID did not change my development style at all. Uh, it, it certainly changed the nature of a lot of the projects I deal with. But I think if anything, it showed us that it's very possible for people to continue to work in isolation, even do pair programming across Zooming. And I think it showed the resilience of our, our agile styles of development. I think it also emphasized that 
distributed development is going to be here to stay. It absolutely is. So uh, I'm not a social engineer. I don't, you know, really know uh, how it might impact things in that regard. But uh, I think the lessons we have learned in these last two years suggest that you're going to see this kind of remote development continue for a lot of people. Besides, it's fun. I'm infinitely more productive when I can control my own time. Okay. I do miss traveling, much. though. I think the question was answered. We will st we are still get getting new questions online. So uh, anybody from the audience, woke up. Anybody has questions? Not yet. Okay. Uh, okay. Next question for you uh, comes from Eugenius. Do you remember your email address in 1967? Who was your ISP? Well, there was no such thing as an ISP because it was the ARPANET. And so it was DARPA or ARPA at that time that managed it for us. If I'm not mistaken, my it was my name. Uh, and I'm, was there even an, R, an ad at that time? I think it was simply uh, Grady at ARPA, if I'm not mistaken. I wish I had remembered it. It didn't carry over because ARPANET addresses did not carry to the public internet. You, have, you must have a great memory. I can't remember my Gmail password every single time. Uh, we have another question from John. As a software developer, should I be scared of robots taking over my job? That's a very serious question. I don't know. How good are you at your job there? <laughs> That's the first question asked. Short answer is no, you should not. I did a TED Talk on this very topic. So go Google uh, Booch TED AI and you'll see my response to it. In fact, that TED Talk was a reaction to Elon Musk. So Elon, around the time, had sort of gotten under his, his skin a book uh, called Super Intelligence by a gentleman out of Oxford in which he was speaking of the existential risk of AI. And, you know, I thought that was just BS, if I may use that phrase. I do not believe there is an existential risk associated with superintelligence. Yes, there's certainly risks associated with AI, especially around human uses of it, especially in systems for which there are obvious biases in the way in which we use them. But in terms of, you know, a real existential risk, it's not something I worry about. We are generations away from building systems that even get close to the kind of decision-making and intelligence that we humans do. And furthermore, I think as a community, the AI community kind of understands where the risks are. Now, that being said, it depends upon where in the world you are, because the discussions I might have with people in Europe or in the United States about ethical uses of AI are very different than the conversations I have when I speak to colleagues in China, because there are fundamentally different ethical foundations for them. So there's work to be done, but I'm happy to see that even military organizations are considering the AI implications of warfare. That's a good sign. Don't be afraid. In fact, another way to not be afraid is Go invent the future. Go build the AIs and be a part of that to ensure it doesn't happen. That's why I'm around these guys. In Grady, we trust them. Uh, Thomas is asking, do you believe that we ever will be able to train models that can pattern match organizations as socio-technical systems, understanding all the important signals of technology delivery, like an AI technology consultant? So. Take a look at the book by Jim Copeline called Organizational Patterns of Ad Development. He's far more expert in this space than I am. But the good news is that folks such as him have begun to discover organizational patterns that, that we can replicate. So I'm not an expert in the space. Jim is, but all signs indicate that, you know, we're learning some things that might be able to answer yes to that question. I think, I don't know what kind of gate did you op open, but we are getting a lot, a, a lot of questions about AIs and robots taking over the world. So I don't know what's happening, but let me ask for the last time. Are you awake? We have questions from the audience. Finally, I am <laughs> very suspicious of what changed. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question is about uh, this current power of AI. It's uh, already powerful enough to build Orwellian type of state uh, to totally sort of control 
people and to intrude in their, uh, their private um, life and uh, take away their rights. And, uh, you know, different uh, developers have different point of view on that. Should we be stay sort of uh, new, politically neutral as much as possible on technical events? Uh, or some others say that, no, in the current society we can't. We should be actually actively showing uh, our political views to try to prevent uh, the fatal consequences. What is your view on that? Observe that the problems of the Orwellian surveillance state were existing in technology long before AI. AI may have accelerated it. But if you look even in the kinds of monitoring that was taking place in pre-AI days, we're talking really, you know, a decade or so ago, the degree of surveillance was already there. And you don't need, you know, an AI to be able to track people on a cell phone. That's just plain old traffic analysis. AI has increased some elements of it relative to things such as uh, 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 facial recognition and the like, which is certainly problematic. And I'm proud that IBM in particular has said, we're simply not going to do that. We're not going to participate in developing technology for facial recognition because the chances of being used for ill are, are too high. You asked the question of the personal responsibility and reaction of the developer, and here's, here's my take on it, and your mileage may vary. And frankly, this comes up a lot when people talk to me about Facebook. Um, every line of code you write is an ethical and moral choice. Your choice of where you work is an ethical choice for people who do have choice. Now, again, this is from this comes from a position of privilege. If you have as a developer the opportunity to choose to work from Facebook or Google or whatever, you're in a position of privilege. Not everybody has that. But if you have that choice, then as an individual, you have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing in this company, is this company consistent with my ethical points of view? And if your answer is no, then don't work for that company and indeed live out your values. Um, I'm running across the same kind of issue when I encounter people working in the, in the realms of NFTs and cryptocurrencies. Personally, I held no crypto, I hold no NFTs because I have real problems associated with them relative to the environmental costs, the, uh, the economic costs associated with them and the like. So I'm living out my, my, uh, uh, my ethical foundations in that regard. And I think that's the right thing to do. So I'll leave it at this. Software increasingly plays a role in the moral lives of humans. And the things we do have consequences far beyond what you might imagine. So as an individual, if you have that choice, be intentional about it. Because what you do may impact others that you may never meet, but you may impact them in positive or negative ways. Try to do things for good. Me personally, you know, my, my personal vendettas are against using AI for, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, defense devices that kill people without human intervention. Uh, I worry about things such as uh, cryptocurrencies and high frequency trading. I worry about and I actively work against software that might be used by a state for oppression. And happily, I am in a position of privilege, so hopefully I can make a difference. But every one of you can make that difference as well. Great question, and thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone from the audience? Yes, we have a, a few hands. Uh, he's closer. I will visit you later. Uh, changing the topic slightly, you, the kind of dominant paradigm for most software developers today is to use a 3GL with some reusable libraries, probably open source. Do you think that's just good enough and we won't see significant change? Or do you think that there's likely to be change in the future to that kind of paradigm? Well, I think it depends upon the domain itself, because in certain domains, that's absolutely good enough. And there are lots of things to automate in that space. But that's not the only thing that's going to be automated. Uh, the, the rise of, I'll take a good example, the rise of Kubernetes, which you mostly see in web-centric systems. I'm starting to see that move to industry, to space. Uh, we're seeing explorations of people putting clouds on rockets in cars. And that's not your classic 3GL kind of thing. In fact, the history of software is such that you see these 
these ecological niches within a domain that we can begin to automate because we do it so often we can afford to invest it and we can afford to invest in it. That's what Ericsson found, for example, with their 3G, 3G systems back in the day. Uh, Ericsson dominated 3G base systems, so they invested in, term, in technology to do model-driven development so that literally you didn't write any code. You wrote models, punched a button, and it produced the code for a variety of devices. What you're describing is exactly that kind of, uh, kind of ecological niche, and it works. It's great, great place to make a living, going to do that for many, many years but it's not the only place where software development is taking place. When you see, again, devices where over here, like I showed you with the, uh, the Jetson Nano, uh, moving them to the edge, all of a sudden, you're not gonna get a 3G language uh, to, to do that kind of thing. You're not gonna see frameworks. You're not gonna see open source stuff there yet. So there's lots and lots of room for innovation. That's why Thank it's a fun you. time to be a developer. And we have one more question from the audience. Hello. Hey, um, I want to circle back to your definition of what architecture is, which is the set of significant decisions where significant is measured by cost of change. Now, the problem with that is oftentimes you don't know that the cost of change is going to be high until after the fact. So it's not particularly actionable. Do you have any, any advice on how to realize that something is going to be expensive or you know, anything of that nature. Going back to the slide I shed, said, showed earlier, that's where the refactoring comes into play. In fact, early within a project, you don't even know enough to ask the right questions to measure the architecture itself, which is why you want to delay architectural decisions as much as possible. But there comes a time where you have to say, you know, I gotta move forward here. In many web-centric systems of scale, the choice of a framework becomes the architectural decision. It's like, I'm gonna use RabbitMQ versus Kafka. That's actually a major architectural decision because there are semantic differences between them. One of them is really meant for blinding speed of streaming. The other, um, RabbitMQ, is a little bit better with regards to uh, predictability of delivery. So you gotta make an educated guess, and that's an architectural decision early on. But you want to have a process that allows you to refactor it and rebuild it over time. Uh, Photoshop did that. And they were able to, without you probably noticing it from the outside, do these four or five major architectural transformations along the way. Architecture change will happen and you delay it as much as you can. And by the way, you're a great straight man to introduce what I'm trying to work on. I'm under contract for two books right now, one on, on architecture, and uh, I hope I'll finish that before the heat death of the universe, but hopefully I'll answer your question there in that book too. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question from the, we are running out of time almost. I, I, I wasn't expecting that many questions, but uh, one more question from the online audience. Uh, is Grady planning to visit Lex Fridman podcast? Would be nice to hear your opinion on many, many topics. <laughs> uh, he's actually invited me and I haven't worked it out to do so. Uh, go ping him again and say, hey, you need to get Grady and that will remind me to talk with him again. So yes, I'd be delighted to do so. Okay, and the last tiny, tiny short question from me, actually. Uh, I kind of know the answer, but I want to hear it in detail. What should change in the crypto uh, world, let's say so, in the NFT world, uh, for you to join it? <laughs> um, I believe that the rise of a digital currency is both inevitable as well as desirable. I do not believe that it will rise up from the privately held coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the like. But rather, think about it. Nations are very protective of their currencies. And, and a lot of what's happening in the crypto space, in some ways, is a reaction to the fact in the U.S. we've got a terrible financial system that makes it difficult to move money back and forth. You see crypto rising in places where there is very much a broken economic system in uh, Venezuela, in El Salvador, in North Korea, uh, in Nigeria, uh, places there's corrupt governments and, and broken economic systems. And it plays a role and a legitimate role because the citizens there have no other route for it. 
But in the mainstream economic world, it still is a drop in the water. I worry about the lack of regulation. I worry about the lack of any kind of accountability. And so it would take a lot for me to move into that realm because I think there are so many negatives associated with it. But great question. But again, last being said, I think digital currencies are inevitable and desirable, but not the ones we've got. Thank you very much. A round, a big round of applause for Grady Booch. Thank you so much for all your answer for your session. Thank you for having me.